I want to start off on a high note. I got to bring my children to Coronado, which I do every day because I bring them to Coronado High School because I have a beach house in Coronado, so I get to go to the public school system every day. And this was an interesting day with my daughter because she complained nonstop the entire way about my wife, who I love and I love my daughter. But what I found is that if you listen to women complain nonstop, they are more likely to pay attention to you the next time you give them some of your advice. And that works the same way with my daughter. It's like you build up some chips. <laughs> you realize that by listening and trying to listen well, they start to trust you. And so I learned something new. And all I had to do was suffer for about 45 minutes small price to pay. So then I get to Coronado, I say, okay, now it's time for me. I get to go do something fun. Do you guys know where the boathouse is down at Glorietta Bay? No. You can go down there and for less than $10, you can take out a shell. And that's what I do. I rowed in college. I love rowing. And since I'm down there, two or three days a week, I go and I check out one of these shells. Somebody, usually Mike or Nick, helps me to carry the little shell, put it in the water. I've already fastened all of the hatches so that it floats and I've, I've got all of the, the everything arranged so that it's the right level for my feet since I'm somewhat short and everybody else in crew is much taller and bigger and has a longer reach but I've got my own boat that nobody ever bothers to, to go and use and it's like I have the entire Coronado Cays all to myself and what I do is I go all the way out of Glorietta Bay over to where the bridge is and I used to cross over to the other side until I almost got run over by a destroyer. <laughs> you see, the destroyers usually have the, the boats, the tugboats come out and create a big wake. So if you're over on the other side and you experience a big wake, you better be looking around to see where the destroyer is that's about to run over you. So I'm a little bit afraid to go over there anymore, seeing how one of them honked at me, and I've never been honked at mm. before. But I had 200 yards to get out of the way before I would have been run over. Because destroyers don't really stop on a dime. So they, they rely on people like myself to know what's behind them. But when you're rowing, you don't really know what's behind them unless you can peer into a tiny little mirror and see the big destroyer. But then you have the sun from the back. It's blinding you. Anyways, it was tough. <coughs> so now I go on over and try and get run over by the ferry. But at least I have people on the ferry clapping. As I go by. So that's sort of fun. So that was the neat part of my day. I'm all sweaty, I'm all gross. I go on over to 49 Antigua, which is my house on the water. And Kiefer and I had had a fantastic time on Saturday. We had actually been out trying out my new uh, water ski. And the water ski is a real thin one that you need to go at about 32 miles per hour. And we have, or we used to have, a wakeboarding boat that was more of a wakeboarding boat. So it has a nice little wake to it. And when you're slalom skiing, you don't really like going through the wake. It's much better to have a boat that doesn't throw a wake. And there's a club that we belong to that meets over in Mission Bay, or at least I belong to it, and I go out Sunday mornings and I practice my water skiing. So we had a fabulous time on Saturday, but when I brought the boat back on Saturday, there's a hydro hoist, and it's hard to tell from this weird sort of drawing here, but these are like pontoons that shoot out of the water, and the whole pontoon actually is about half out of the water here. Here's the level of the water. And this is sort of shooting up at an angle because the other half is under the water. So my boat sort of looked like this with the back of it now under the water. And there was all sorts of gasoline and oil spills everywhere. <laughs> And I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now? Now, I had known that my hydrofoist was broken on Saturday, because when I tried to lift the boat out of the water, only the front went up and the back didn't. And we figured out that it must be the engine uh, to, the, to the little vacuum cleaner. So since I'm normally cheap, I get on the phone and I called up the hydrofoist people and I said, I'm going to need a new motor. And they said, well, we can send somebody out. It'll be probably a week to get it done. I said, my boat will probably be at the bottom of the ocean in a week. I need it sooner than that. And they said, well, we can send it in 48 hours if you think you can install it yourself. 
I said, well, hey, it's just a couple screws and a, and a couple little bolts. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it myself and I'll save $400. Well, the part hasn't yet arrived. <laughs> so when I showed up today, the boat, which was supposed to be half, at least out of the water, had now sunken down about three or four feet into the back of the water so that the water was now covering the engine. That's not a good sign. That's a pretty bad sign. And so I was in a little bit of a state of panic wondering what I was supposed to do. But I remembered what I was told yesterday by the people who were selling me the $400 motor. And he said, occasionally you can use a, a vacuum cleaner to a shop vac to go ahead and reverse it and blow air into it. So I disassembled the little hydro hoist white, they have like a little white box that's on the side. And the way the hydro hoist works is this white box is right here and it has a little motor and it blows all of the air into these pontoons and the pontoons are divided with half of the air up front and half behind so I had a two-stage pontoon which is why the front was filled with air and the back wasn't and the back is where all of the motor is which is why my engine died before it could lift the back of the motor because that's where all the weight was so I have my little shop back and I'm sitting there waiting and now I, I've disassembled the white thing, so I have to turn all the valves with a wrench because the normal little controls aren't working. So I'm down there fiddling around, figuring out, okay, I can make this work. And I managed to get about the boat about two-thirds out of the water with still a portion of it in the water. So it wasn't in danger of sinking. And I called up my buddy Mario over a boat grotto and said, what am I going to do now, Mario? And he said, well, your boat is pretty much totaled. It's a total loss. You can set fire to it if you want. I said, not likely. It's half underwater. He said, well, in that case, you need to go get vessel assist. And vessel assist will come and pump out that mess before you get an environmental fine for polluting oh. the entire marine. And I thought, why did I not think of that? <coughs> and he said, because it costs you $2,700 to, call, to uh, call vessel assist. I said, really? He said, yes, because they're there and they are the only ones who are still in business and they need to prevent you from getting a worse fine. So I call Vessel Assist, and around this time my wife calls and says, hey, guess what, you gotta go pick up the kids. They're sitting around waiting for you at 12 o'clock. So I say, okay, throw everything away, start going to get the kids, and I had done something which, as I'm driving, I realized in order to get this boat out of the water, I had taken some straps and put it at the top of this dock. So this is the dock right here, and this is the big concrete partition that comes out. And in order to hoist the boat out, there's like a little hook in the back of the boat. And I'd taken a bunch of these straps that had ratchets. And I had five different straps there so I could individually wrap it to the, the, the uh, straps to help lift up the back of the boat. Because my back wasn't strong enough to do the same job, though I tried. So five straps are sitting there. And as I'm going on the way to pick up my kids, I thought, you know, those straps were a lot tighter when I left than when I first put them on. As tight as I could tie them, they were a little bit tighter. <gasps> the tide is going out! <laughs> and this whole boat is either going to be lifted <laughs> out of the water, or it's going to rip these straps off, or I'm going to tear off a portion of this concrete. So I get to my kids and it's like, uh, guys, we're going back to the boat. So we're going back to the boat to try and solve the problem that I had just caused myself. Luckily I wasn't in the traffic accident on the way back, so the whole time I'm sitting in the long line coming down the strand watching the other people who are being carted away in an ambulance, I'm thinking, okay, well my life could be worse. It could actually be worse, but the longer it takes for me to get through this line, the more my boat damage is going to happen. So by the time I get there, I tell the kids, now we need to start unloading the boat, you take all the stuff, and meanwhile I go on over to these straps, these straps are so tight, the boat's been lifted about a foot out of the water. So now it's like, okay, well, the pontoons need to be floated up to support the boat that's now suspended without the pontoons <laughs> blowing up. So I immediately go reassemble the whole contraption, blow more air in there to try and get the pontoons up. Still, there's too much pressure on these straps, I can't undo the straps. I have to go get a knife in the kitchen, 
By this time I've got glasses on, uh, sunglasses, because I know those straps are going to whip around and whack my eye out. So at least I need some protection so that I'd only get partial damage to my vision for the next several years rather than losing an eyeball. And I'm up there with a knife <laughs> going like this to take the top straps off, pop, pop, and immediately the boat falls down a foot. But it doesn't sink and I don't lose an eyeball. And my kids are laughing at me. The kids love to laugh at me. I don't know why. <laughs> Finally, the vessel assist guys get there, and they have their $2,700. They don't tell me that up front. That's at the end of the day after they've already done the work. And I'm sort of like, what can I do now? And they pump out a little bit, and now I have to go get my trailer. Well, I go all the way back to El Cajon to get my trailer. It's a two-hour trip. Now it's about 3 o'clock. I know the place I have to go bring this to is going to close at 6. So I'm bringing my trailer from the place in El Cajon after having dropped my kids off. And when I get on over to Pepper to pick up the boat, which has been taken over by the vessel assist guys, who luckily were, 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 didn't sink it on the way over, I realize I have no air in my tires. Oh, Jesus. The trailer has no air in the tires, and I am lucky not to have popped all of the tires from it having no air and me not noticing. But I didn't notice until the boat was on top of it after having picked it up out of the water. That really emphasized how the tires were about ready to pop. I couldn't even get the boat from the boat slip over to a place to pump up the tires. So, I'm wandering through the marina asking people who have bikes on RVs, do you happen to have an air pump? Do you happen to have an air pump? About the third person I get to says, oh yes we do, it's an electrical one. So I go to try and hook it up to my boat, isn't this ridiculous? This is just ridiculous, I mean you can't even make this stuff up. And the cord doesn't stretch far enough. So now I have to unhook my car from the trailer, but the trailer is on an incline. So we have to go try and find something to stuff underneath the tires so that when I unhook the trailer, thank God these guys have done this before because I didn't even think about putting something underneath the back of the tire. It could quite easily have shot down and caused some real major damage, but they found some wood to stuff underneath there. So as I got the trailer off, I then had to back the car up plug into the electronic air pump, and pump up all of my tires. Whew. So now it's 5.12, and the place I'm supposed to bring it to closes at 6 o'clock. But luckily, I had my ways, and the ways told me the fast way to get there, and I went the slow way. Because going the slow way means that all of the stuff that's on the boat doesn't get blown off, because you're only going 40 or 45 miles per hour on the freeway instead of 60. I've had that problem before where all of the cargo, just all the cargo can there just get blown off and ripped up and destroyed. So I finally get on over, pull on in, back it up, let it go, and here I am tonight. Is that a great day or what? <laughs>